All right, we can go ahead and start. So welcome everybody. Um, this today we're going to be talking with uh, Nathan Fluger, who is the uh, Precision Ag Coordinator with Pheasants Forever in Nebraska. And um, today we're going to be talking about some of their uh, the Pathways for Wildlife program and some of their uh, citizen science data collection projects and programs they have going on. Um, Master Naturalists have been involved with some of these studies for, I believe, last two years. Um, and then so we have some folks who uh, are planning to get or stay involved again for this year. And so we're just trying to help uh, promote um, the uh, the studies. And we have a new group of Master Naturalists that just went through training here this last this last weekend that are also looking for stuff to do. And so um, for other Master Naturalists that are on this call today too, I encouraged uh, checking out our online events calendar. Uh, we just loaded up a whole bunch of uh, volunteer opportunities and continuing education opportunities that are up there for April and May, um, and some spilling over into June already. And so, um, but yeah, and so without uh, any further introduction, I'll just go ahead and hand it over to Nathan. Perfect. Thank you, Matt. I am working on sharing my screen here now. Go. Perfect. So, um, as Matt said, my name is Nathan Fluger, and I'm the Precision Ag Coordinator for Pheasants Forever here in Nebraska. And today I want to cover um, more specifically, some of our programs um, within a row crop dominated landscape, uh, which is where I focus my efforts. And then after I cover those, give you some background information on that, um, different practices that we have going, um, where the program's going in the future. And then I'll follow that up with a couple um, of opportunities to help out, as Matt said. So, um, for my position as the Precision Ag Coordinator, it's a little different than what you might expect from your normal farm bill biologist uh, with Pheasants Forever. I am actually focused on working with row crop producers. So my goal is to work within a row crop dominated landscape and make a difference for wildlife by diversifying the landscape. And we also want to make a difference for that producer as well since they are working, since we are working with them on their row crop acres. Um, <clears throat> the Pathways for Wildlife program is a three-pronged program. There's a pathway for grasslands, the precision ag and conservation component, um, which I'll be covering today, and then there is also a Pathways for Community Habitat as well. Um, and then this particular program is a partnership program between Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever, uh, the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, the NRCS, or Natural Resource Conservation Service, um, it is grant funded through the, the Nebraska Environmental Trust as well. Um, and then as Matt alluded to, there have been some master naturalists that have helped out as well. Um, so when it comes with work to working with row crop producers in a row crop dominated landscape, I'm looking for producers who are um, open to trying new things on their operation. So maybe interceding into standing corn or soybeans, getting some something green in that understory. Um, producers worried about erosion control on crop fields, um, keeping sediment out of our waterways, um, keeping excess nutrients out of our waterways, um, people adding forage to their operation, uh, producers interested in wildlife, right? So I see a lot of row crop producers who are really interested um, in working with me because they've always wanted to help wildlife in one form or another, but when it comes to their commodity crop acres, it can sometimes be very difficult to do that on there since there's not a lot of programs um, outside of perennial habitat. Um, obviously producers interested in soil health, that's a big one that brings guys in the door. Um, and then those odd areas in and around crop fields that are currently cropped, um, but maybe shouldn't be for some reason, whether their equipment's now too large or maybe those acres are red acres, which they are underperforming or they're a negative return on investment. So they're sinking money into those acres. 
um, and then they're losing it year after year. So that's where we talk about turning red acres green. So my particular focus area um, to start out, it is actually located in the rainwater basin wetland complex here on the um, eastern edge of it. And that, show, that is shown in the top right map there. If we look at the, the large map um, <clears throat> on the screen, you can see my uh, 10 county or 11 counties, excuse me, outlined in red right there. And those include Merrick, Polk, Butler, Hamilton, Seward, Adams, Clay, Fillmore, and Saline counties. Um, and as you can see right away, there's a lot of green within that coverage area with, which actually denotes cropland. So we're definitely working in a row crop dominated landscape. The good thing about working within that rainwater basin complex is that there are pockets of upland and wet or upland and lowland areas that are actually um, strongholds for our game bird populations throughout this area. So um, there, there, or really that is the main reason that we're focusing within this area because there are in fact pockets of birds there. And why is this area dominated by row crop agriculture? Well, first of all, it is some of the most productive soils in Nebraska. Uh, there's good annual precipitation in most years. Obviously, we've had a couple of drought years here, but normally um, exceptional precipitation. And then we also have the um, capability for irrigation as well. So a lot of center pivot irrigation within these counties, if you're not familiar. So when it comes to working within a row crop dominated landscape, what are we lacking? Um, first and foremost, we're lacking perennial habitat or interest in that CRP program. And the reason for that is, is because historically and really today, those CRP rental rates are not competitive with what row crop producers are able to get in cash rent or um, what they're getting back from raising a commodity crop on those acres. So um, that is troublesome. Um, crop diversity and landscape heterogeneity is lacking, right? So within this coverage area, the two main crops are corn and soybeans, which more often than not is in a um, alternate year rotation. So one year it's corn, corn, the next year it's soybeans, and then those alternate back and forth. Um, and then weedy species in the understory of our crop fields are lacking. Um, historically, we used to have a lot more weeds in our row crop fields. And then today, the chemistry that is available to row crop producers has really um, cut back on the weedy species out there on the landscape. And the good thing about those weedy species in the understory is that there's green material, not only down close to the ground, but it attracts insects for our game bird chicks, which um, are extremely important within the first couple months of their life cycle. Um, and then another thing that's really lacking would be winter habitat because post harvest of corn and soybeans, there's very little structure, usable structure out in these row crop fields for our game birds. So if they are out and about in those fields, it's definitely, um, they're definitely gonna be exposed to a number of predators out there. So here, if we look over on the pheasant's web of life, there's really three main cover types that are necessary for, uh, the pheasant reproductive cycle. Um, the first would be the nesting cover. So the game birds have to have an area where they can uh, get off a successful nest, usually taller grass. Um, brood cover is gonna be the next important one. So that is going to entail where that, that hen pheasant or that hen quail or really any game bird is gonna take those chicks so they can brood or look for food, insects, um, things of that nature. And then as we discussed down on the bottom, winter, winter cover or winter habitat is really going to be um, lacking as well post-harvest. So to combat all of those issues, Pheasants Forever here in Nebraska has looked to cover crops to really fill that void and then also to diversify that landscape. So cover crops can potentially offer a wide variety of benefits along with diversifying the system. So getting something out there besides corn and soybeans is a plus. Um, more and more research is actually looking into game bird use of cover crops, and they are showing, the research is showing that if those cover crops are present on the landscape, that game birds will in fact use them. So that's another um, positive for us. And then there's a need for healthy soils, clean water, which translates to healthy local communities. And with Pheasants Forever being a grassroots organization, 
any time that we can get behind a practice or program that's going to strengthen those local communities or benefit them in some way, it seems like a no brainer for us. So I mentioned um, more recently, a lot more of the research has really focused on, or is beginning to focus, excuse me, on the biodiversity and wildlife habitat component of cover crops. But historically, most of that research has really focused on the soil health benefits. So everything from erosion control and keeping that ground covered, utilizing that root biomass to keep the soil covered, keep the um, soil particles and excess nutrients out of waterways. Um, compaction management is another one that's been looked at, utilizing different cover crop species to break up those compactions or hard pan layers to help infiltrate more water. And then soil nutrient management, again, is another one. So how can we utilize different species of cover crops to maybe help fix atmospheric nitrogen or suck up excess nutrients that are with, out there in the fields um, to stop those from leaching into groundwater, um, tie them up, keep them in the field for use at a different date. So all of that to say, it's good for us that a bulk of the research has been in the soil health realm because we can go to a row crop producer, focus on their soil health, get these cover crops within their cropping rotations, and then we still get that biodiversity or wildlife benefit as a secondary benefit. So as I mentioned, I work out of the Pathways for Precision Ag program. Um, and that program was actually rolled out in 2019, March of 2019, actually. So um, it was a little late getting started as far as promotion that first year, but we were able to finish with 12 contracts totaling a little over a thousand acres across four of those counties. Um, in 2020, obviously we see a pretty big jump to 20 contracts and a little over 2,500 acres across eight counties. And then in 2021, um, again, we see, another, we see another jump in contracts, but we see a reduction in the amount of acres that we took in. And the reason for that is because since 2019, the program has continually evolved and we've added different practices to focus on certain scenarios or, or areas of crop fields that we think are gonna be more beneficial to wildlife. So that's where we see that little drop in 2021 as far as number of acres. And then in 2022, again, we see them back up because those programs are actually, um, more producers are starting to hear about them and they're becoming more interested and you can tell that by the number of contracts that continue to rise. So as of 2022, um, we had a little over 8,000 acres of cover crops on the ground. This year with one of our full season practices, which I'll get into a little later, we're already sitting at um, 500 acres for starting this year. So definitely off to a really good start. Um, and here, I'll touch on this picture here on the left side. As I mentioned, um, the program's always evolved and that's really because of seeing stuff on the landscape, how it's implemented or just talking with producers. So for this particular picture, there was a row crop producer who wanted to add forage to his um, operation in 2019. So I worked with him, we planted a diverse cover crop mixture um, in some isolation acres on his seed corn, on his seed corn acres. Um, and when he went in and swathed this forage crop on July 14th, he ended up sucking a hen pheasant off of her nest, um, exposing that nest and exposing it to predators. And obviously that nest didn't make it. But what I realized there was this, these acres were across the road from a private wetland and then a public WMA. And if you recall, 2019 was a really wet spring. So what we think happened was this hen pheasant more than likely got flooded out of her first nest attempt and then moved to higher ground in this diverse, in this diverse forage crop and tried another nest attempt. So what that is showing us is that they might not necessarily be trying to conduct their first nest attempt in these stands, but at least it, it, it can be an option or seems to be an option if needed for those game birds. So moving forward to our 2023 program options here, um, there's really three different options that we offer. The first, which is our most general option, most basic, is going to be our general soil health and forage contracts. 
For these particular contracts, we take a certain number and all we do is cost share 75% of the cover crop seed cost. And then planting, termination, and use of that cover crop are up to the landowner. Um, and those are, those are more focused on helping a row crop producer, um, getting new people in the door, spreading the word about the program. Um, there can be potential for those contracts to have a wildlife benefit, but more than likely it's more geared towards soil health. Um, our second option is going to be cover crops planted after winter cereal harvest. So if a row crop producer has winter wheat, cereal rye, or another winter cereal within their cropping rotation that they actually take to harvest, if they agree to follow that harvest up with a diverse cover crop planted prior to July 15th, and then leave that cover crop biomass standing until March 15th of the following year, we will cost share 75% of their cover crop seed cost. And then that producer is also eligible for up to $50 an acre in foregone income payments. So with that, with that particular practice right there, we see um, there's a winter cereal out there, there's potential nesting habitat in that winter cereal. So that's one of the reasons we wanna see it back in the rotation. And then when that cover crop is planted mid-July, we're getting, there's potential to get significant biomass accumulated prior to a killing frost. And since they have to leave it standing until March 15th, that means that there is going to be usable biomass out there on the landscape for our game birds that are within those areas and, and really all wildlife. Um, and then that third option, which um, I'm really most excited about and a lot of other people are, would be our full season cover crop practice. Um, well, whoops, I kind of jumped the gun on some of the small grain stuff. Um, but again, adding that biomass to the landscape, like I said, through fall and winter months. And then, like I said, we're working with row crop producers. So we also want to pull in that soil health benefit when we can. So not only is that cover crop providing that wildlife benefit, but it's keeping a living root in the ground for, for a longer time throughout the growing season. It's keeping the soil covered, and then it's utilizing excess nutrients and potentially sequestering some, some more nutrients for later use. Um, and then in specific scenarios, some producers elect to graze that biomass instead of leaving it out there year round, which is completely fine. Um, but again, you can see a, uh, that'd be a early August, mid-August picture at the top left. And then in the bottom right, that's the biomass after a killing frost is coming. So a little more on the full season cover crop practice. For this particular practice, we are looking for producers who have productive row crop acres within two miles of existing quality perennial habitat. So that can be wildlife management areas, it can be different easements, it can be CRP fields, it can be wetlands. But what we're really searching for is um, quality native habitat that game birds are using. If the producer agrees to plant a diverse cover crop mixture prior to June 1st, and then leave that biomass standing until the following March 15th, that producer is eligible for up to a $300 per acre foregone income payment and a 75% cost share on that cover crop seed. Um, <clears throat> if a producer is going to enroll irrigated acres, there is a maximum contract size of 80 acres. If that producer is enrolling dry land acres, there is a maximum of 40 acres. Um, and then those that cover crop species that we use is usually 10 to 12 species. There is a picture here on the left. You can see that there are, in fact, sunflowers in there, which are pretty neat to see. But we do have a variety or a number of other flowering species in there as well. So a little more um, on that full season cover crop practice. Um, we are looking for irrigated acres and seed corn isolation acres. And I touched on the seed corn isolation acres a little bit, um, but for those that aren't familiar with the seed corn isolation acres, if a producer is growing seed corn, so that corn crop is to produce seeds for a subsequent year for other farmers, if they are growing that, there needs to be buffer strips on the edge of that field so that there isn't cross-pollination from any conventional corn that's in the area. Um, and normally soybeans are planted on those acres. 
So we have targeted those acres as a way to diversify the landscape, diversify their, their uh, cropping system in that way. So if a producer has irrigated acres and or seed corn isolation acres, they are eligible for a $300 per acre uh, payment along with that 75% cost share on the seed. If a producer is looking to enroll dry land acres, we then break it down by soil capability class um, and then break the payments down as well. So if a producer is going to enroll soils that are a capability class one through four, they can expect a $225 per acre payment. Capability classes five through eight are gonna be $140 an acre. And the reason we have those breaks in there is because Capability class one through four, you can, you can think of those as your normal, highly productive row crop acres. Once you start getting into capability class five through eight, we start seeing different problems with soils, whether they're gonna be too sandy, they might flood out potentially, they might be on a slope. So things like that that are going to make those, those acres less productive as a whole. And that's why we reduced that um, payment rate there. And then for those, productive or those unproductive soils, we have a perennial conversion payment. So if a producer wants to enroll those acres into a perennial um, planting, we will actually uh, pay them or they're eligible to receive a one-time incentive payment of $50 an acre. So again, that's where we start to tie in that idea of finding those red acres and turning them green. So how does the full season cover crop practice help? Um, watching here on the left, that is a time-lapse photo of one of our full season cover crops. So just to give you a little idea there. But it's helping because with these being planted prior to June 1st, that biomass is up and growing in June and July, which means there's going to be potential nesting habitat out there on the landscape if game birds choose it. Um, as I mentioned before, we have a number of flowering plants within these these cover crop species or these cover crop mixtures. So all of those flowering plants and all of that green material attracts an abundance of insects and pollinators, which is what we need for brood rearing habitat. Um, I always tell people, if you are allergic to any sort of bees, this is not the place that you wanna be in July or August because it is mind blowing how many bees are out there. Um, and then again, here in February is all this runs to, but it has to stay until March. So then you can see that there are going to be, uh, there's going to be winter habitat and foraging resources for those game birds. From a producer standpoint, planting this full season cover crop, they don't have to have as many inputs associated with these acres. So they don't have to fertilize them. They don't have uh, multiple chemical applications for them. And if it's actually under a pivot, the producers don't have to irrigate this cover crop as well. So um, on top of the inputs, it's gonna be less trips across those acres for that producer. So right up front, it's saving them money um, in those ways. And then obviously there's numerous soil health benefits associated with cover crop use, and especially long-term cover crop use with excessive biomass. So this is a really new practice as far as the full season one. <clears throat> and to my knowledge, we're really the only organization that's trying it out. So monitoring is very important for us because with these payment levels that we're paying producers, we need to ensure that these practices are not only beneficial to the row crop producer, but the wildlife that we're trying to help as well. Um, some of those assessments that we do and we've done in the past, we do some soil health assessments, mainly looking at water infiltration tests, um, changes in, in signs of soil biology, changes in the compaction layer, and really just tried to give that soil an overall health rating from year to year. Um, one of the challenges with some of the soil health components or the soil health assessments is that it takes, it can take a number of years for soil to really have a major change. So Things that we're, we're really gonna focus on now are gonna be the probably mainly the water infiltration tests and maybe changes in signs of soil biology. Um, we have done some small mammal trapping in conjunction with Nebraska master naturalists and particularly Mike Schrod, which has been awesome. Um, and I'll get into a little bit of that later. Um, but then camera traps are another big one for us on this particular project. 
So for the small mammal trapping, um, again, Mike Schrod has been awesome helping with that. And we wanted to know, will cover crops increase small mammal species diversity, relative density, and species richness as compared to adjacent cropland? So comparing our diverse cover crop mixture to that adjacent corn and or soybean field. Um, we conduct this particular uh, monitoring effort with Sherman traps. And when weather permits, we trap in the spring, the summer, and the fall. Um, for our small mammal staff trapping, we actually have three years of data. And it is a small data set, but however, it suggests that species diversity, relative density, and species richness are higher in the cover crop compared to that adjacent corn or soybean field. Um, so that's pretty exciting to see. Um, <clears throat> on to the camera traps now. Like I said, camera traps are another, another big monitoring component for us. And the reason for that is, is these camera traps can be out there all day and night, and they can be looking for, for those game birds when and how they're using them. So we don't have to be out there doing consistent flush counts or anything like that. A little less invasive as far as moving birds around. Um, but they're answering the question, are game birds using these full season cover crop acres? And to date, we can say, yes, in fact, they are. And they're using them throughout the year, which is really fun to see. So when a site is selected uh, for camera traps, there are two camera traps that are deployed, one on the interior and one on the exterior of the cover crop site. Um, <clears throat> Last year, or ex excuse me, two years ago now, we had eight sites with camera traps and all eight of those sites actually had pictures of pheasants and or quail on. Um, this year we ended with six of seven sites having either pictures of pheasants and or quail on. So um, only one of those sites didn't capture anything obviously, but what we did capture on that particular site was a lot of feral cat activity. So. Not to say that game birds aren't gonna be in the area with feral cats, but it was just interesting to see a lot of feral cat activity and no quail within a, an area where you would expect quail to be. Um, and then we see a lot of brood activity on these cameras. So just kind of running through the pictures here, um, at the top left, you can see a brood right there. Um, pretty small, we got a quail in the top right, a bobwhite quail. One of my favorite pictures to date of a pheasant um, would be the middle one on the right. You can actually see a hen pheasant dusting herself on the dust coming off of it, um, which was pretty neat to see. And, and the other neat thing is we have those broods when they are days old, stumbling around the cover crops. And then in that bottom right photo, that's actually a pheasant brood that really grew up in front of the trail camera. Um, you can see a few hens there and then that back, that back, uh, pheasant on the back right is actually a young rooster who is just starting to get his color. So it's pretty neat to watch the, the, the time pass and some broods grow up within these cover crop mixtures. So what are the next steps of the program? Um, we need to and we want to continue to evolve not only the program, but our existing cover crop practices. So as I mentioned, that full season cover crop practice really came from um, that first forage contract where, unfortunately, a hen pheasant went through the swather and exposed the nest. But right there, we learned something and we were able to mold it into a practice that producers are now actually using on the landscape, which is exciting to see. Um, another way we've uh, altered that particular practice is looking at standability through the winter. So um, in those first year, we were using some really tall sorghum sedan species. So in the wind, rain, and snow, a lot of that would eventually lay over. Um, and it still provided cover for those birds, but it wasn't standing as tall as we would have liked to see. So we have worked on those mixtures to help with standability through the winter. Um, we're gonna continue looking for partnerships that allow the full season practice to be a viable long-term option for those row crop producers who are interested in it. Um, this past year, actually, um, or excuse me, the past winter, Syngenta actually signed on as a partner for this full season cover crop practice. So we're actually working with them and have attended uh, multiple grower meetings, getting in front of their seed corn producers to um, hopefully have more isolation acres enrolled, which is pretty exciting to see 
that they wanted to sign on. Um, and really my grand goal here is to compile enough pilot data for a full scale research project for this practice within the rainwater basin. Um, and the reason for that is, is there's not, there's really not much research within a landscape like ours, um, number one at all, but number two, focusing on cover crops and how can we place these cover crops on the landscape and get a bird, a game bird benefit. So maybe some of those questions as far as how far can we place these cover crops from perennial habitat or really how much perennial habitat needs to be within an area to even think about a cover crop like these. So definitely a lot of questions that um, can be looked at from a research lens. So moving into the volunteer opportunities, if anyone is interested, um, and I will preface this, I have, oh heck, three or four um, volunteers who have helped the past couple years who've really enjoyed um, the, the practice and helping out on the project. And they've actually said, keep me in mind, I'm interested in doing another one if you have a site that's around me. So if you're interested in running a camera trap, um, camera, a set of camera traps, and we have them in a location that's suitable for you. Um, that would look something like assisting with the camera trap setup. Um, then once we have that initial setup done and we have the cover crop biomass controlled in front of that camera, it would be up to the volunteer to go out there and keep that plant growth down so we have an open area to photograph wildlife species using these and then swap those SD cards as needed. So depending on how well that plot is kept clean um, and how much wildlife travel you get, that will depend on how often those, those SD cards need to be swapped. Um, initially, I say that probably every other week would be good to get out there um, in the growing season just to ensure that that biomass is under control. Um, and then after that, when you're swapping out those SD cards, uploading those photos to a OneDrive, a OneDrive link um, for storage and future use and potential research projects. Um, as of now, current counties that have uh, camera trap sites include Merrick, Polk, Butler, York, Seward, Fillmore, and Saline counties. So just because one of these sites is within this county doesn't mean we necessarily need to use it. Um, I want to select sites based off first off of quality. So we want to make sure we're getting these camera traps put up on quality sites. But then I also want to make sure that it's going to align with volunteer location, right? So if somebody is really interested in pursuing something like this, I don't want to have to make them drive two hours for a site. So hopefully we can find a quality site closer to them. Um, what else was I going to say here? Um, yeah, and if for some reason, I mean, it's super flexible, say you want to take on a site and you say, hey, Nate, I can't make it. I have, I'm have i going to be gone for a week or, or something like that. We always go back and forth. I can help check it this week or, or anything like that. So um, it, it definitely is a commitment, but don't think you're married to it from sometime in June till the following March 15th. But these camera traps do stay out probably Early to mid-June, we put them out since that cover crop needs to be planted by June 1st. And then they do run until March 15th or the week before March 15th of the following year. So they'll run till March 15th of 2024. Um, and then another survey op opportunity, we haven't pursued this one um, heavily yet. And the reason for that is, is I just have way too much stuff going on. Um, and coordinating so I can't get out to a bunch of these sites for pollinators and other insect species surveys. Um, but as I mentioned, those pollinators and insect species are very important to the game bird chicks in the first couple months. So any data or any reference we can pull from these sites about insect activity, species identif identification would be great. Um, and as I mentioned, we have pretty diverse mixtures. Currently, we have seven different flowering species within our diverse cover crop mixture. So really trying to pull those insects and pollinators into these plots. Um, and as I mentioned, a tremendous amount of insects and pollinators within the plots. Again, if you're allergic to bees, this might not be um, something that you do wanna pursue. Um, but as I mentioned, there hasn't been a lot of interest in this area. Um, and the reason for that is it, 
is it would be best if somebody had some knowledge on insect or pollinator identification already in their back pocket. Um, so then we could sit down, make a survey together, maybe a line survey or a, a, a transect survey of some sort would be beneficial. Um, but for this particular opportunity, if you're interested, reach out, we can look up, look up a protocol together that, that um, is gonna work for you and we can move forward um, that way. Uh, so with that, um, I'll end on a video here. One of the perks of my job is I get to take my dog to work with me um, when I'm going out and checking fields. And this is actually one of those full season cover crop sites. Uh, this was two years ago now. And when I take my, my dog with me, he'd, get, he'd have a blast flushing pheasants out of these plots. And um, so it's really neat to kind of see that, that plot being used year round in that scenario. So I was just going out to check some camera traps and that's what we found. But I'll open it up for any questions or anything that anybody has. Uh, my contact information is right there. Uh, that 402-646-5426, that is actually my cell phone. Um, shoot me a text, give me a call at any point in time. And I believe Matt said my contact information is also um, somewhere on, a, on your guys' website as well. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions for Nathan? You can either unmute yourself or write them in the chat. I see we have one from Melissa. I would be interested in pollinator surveys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, would you are you wanting to mainly focus on um, pollinators or really insects or and and either way if you want to focus on um, the pollinator surveys that would be great too I don't know um, is part of the B Atlas training do you have a designated site or do you just have a county that you need a location to actually survey in because that might be somewhat some a way where we could kind of kill mm -hmm. two birds with one stone for you. Right. Um, hi, this is Melissa. Um, and pollinator issues are something that I've been working with kind of at a, at a hobbyist level for the last two to three years and something that I would be interested in, in kind of becoming more skilled as a surveyor. So if you were looking for those specifically, I, I am already attending the Bee Atlas training. That's not until I think next weekend or yeah it's next weekend on the 15th um so the nature of those surveys and whether they're um uh, matt you might know more about those mm -hmm. than i do uh I, I don't know if they're if you have to have a dedicated site or a, a, a county a, something i will be learning more about also i know okay. that Damon parks does a monarch mm -hmm. and uh, ooh, the uh, real thank you. Too. Yep. Yeah, and I'm I'm attending that one at the end of May. So I would be I would be interested and anxious mm -hmm. to put those skills to um, uh, further develop them and put them to use. Absolutely, and as I said, there's a lot of potential here. Um, I think maybe the best course of action would be to go through those trainings mm -hmm. um, and learn a little more. I I read up on that project briefly um, a couple years ago, so I can't remember all the specifics of it. Um, but if you need a specific county or a specific site that meets that criteria, I mean, like I said, these sites in um, July to August mm -hmm. are full of pollinators. And then again, I don't, I don't know their survey window either, but um, we could probably find something for you. And if you just wanna want to come out and kind of do this on your own to, um, better your skills or your knowledge. I mean, we can go that route too. So the, the pollinator stuff is definitely not strict or, or anything like that. Sure. Well, I will just kind of plan on sitting through these trainings and then mm -hmm. circling back through your email or phone number in order to figure out how I can apply those and if there can be a mutual benefit. Yeah, I think, I think be that sounds of, great. I think there would be some overlap. Yeah, it'd be neat, especially yeah. with the bee atlas, because um, mm -hmm. they're focused on native 
bee species. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so that yeah, would be they're focused on all you know bumblebee species, um, and highlighting the the native ones. Yeah. Yeah, and I would. I mean, there's no shortage of bumblebees within these plots. <laughs> Well, uh, we had another question in the chat from uh, Dan, wondering if this program um, has any potential to expand to uh, southeast Nebraska. Because he's down yeah, in good question, Johnson Dan. County. No. Is that where he's Johnson County? Mm -hmm. um, that's where my in-laws are at, but that's besides the point. Um, so the reason I'm focused within this coverage area currently is because my bosses, or the powers that be said, if we can make a program work here, we're pretty much gonna be able to do it anywhere in the state of Nebraska. Um, so that's kind of the mindset they've moved mm -hmm. forward with. I am currently a statewide resource for Nebraska. So when it comes to cover crop questions, building mixtures, um, really anything like that, I am a resource and can, and can help out that way. And yes, our goal is to um, as we find other partners and better funding, more solid funding is to expand this program um, across Nebraska. Um, originally, we in fact only did York and then the surrounding eight counties. And then when Syngenta signed on, we actually added Adams and Hall County. So mm -hmm. I know that's definitely not the southeast corner of Nebraska or moving that way, but I, that just goes to show as we, as we get those partners, um, we do plan on expanding. There's probably a lot, there's yeah. a lot of more, a lot more forage uses and needs down in the southeast. I would, I would say. Well, I had one other question for you too, as far as um, so what are what's like the average um, species that are in like a cover crop like seed mix, or like how yeah. much does the producer can they custom request things in there? Yeah, great question. So. On our full season mixtures, we actually shoot to keep that the same mixture across all sites, unless there is a um, a problem with a producer in a single species. Like if a producer is growing winter wheat in their rotation, we can't have cereal rye within that mixture because it could mm -hmm. become a weed within his cropping rotation, essentially. So at that point, we'll pull out ones and two species here and there for the full season stuff. The reason that we keep the full season stuff the same is just for comparison across site. Mm -hmm. um, that's that reason. When it comes to developing cover crop mixtures um, for uses at other times during the year, it's, it's hard to say that there's one particular species that's gonna be in that mixture because there's warm season cover crops, there's mm -hmm. cool seasons, there's grasses, there's forbs. So it really just comes down to the specific scenario and that producer's goals and objectives. Okay. What I can say is one of the most common cover crop species used in Nebraska at this point would be cereal rye. And that is because it can be planted after corn and soybean harvest mm -hmm. most years. Um, and really that winter cereal fits well within that cropping rotation because they plant it later in the fall early winter, and then it greens up in the spring, and then they terminate that prior to planting. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, for weed control and mm -hmm. things like that. So cereal rye is the most used, I would say. Um, outside of that, it can, it depends. All right, well, we have one more question that we can end on here um, from Ryan. He's asking, are there any requirements or expectations for anyone interested in the, or in helping with camera traps for the cover crops? Is there any more information available for those wanting to help out? I would say, um, so as far as expectations, we can, it would be nice to have uh, somebody say, hey, I can take this camera trap and just plan on them being there mm -hmm. um, from start to end. Um, and as I said, we can go back and forth. If there's a reason you can't make it there one week or another or multiple times, obviously I can fill in. Um, but if I'm going to set someone up with a set of camera traps and they're only able to do it half the time, and then it's an hour and a half drive for me, um, that, that can get a little tricky as far as 
billing that after um, you're done with it. So I would say if you can commit to it, that would be really the only only expectation or, or hope, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested, reach out to me um, in an email with your location and really your county and your location, and then really just how far you're willing to travel. And then from there, I can figure out um, a good site for you or see if we have one that meets your, yeah. your requirements. Well, great. I appreciate your time uh, this afternoon, Nathan. Um, and so we will, what we'll do here is we will, uh, I'll have this uh, video, I'll have it posted on our website, and then we'll also send that out back to our master naturalists um, with your information, and then also kind of just direct them to um, the information that we have on our page as well. And so we're hoping to Give you some more volunteers to help in this effort this year. No, I, I really appreciate you uh, allowing me the opportunity to present. And like I said, I mean, I've had great volunteers in the past um, that really enjoy the program. And, and to be honest, I mean, they're a, they're a huge help. So I definitely couldn't run all these camera traps by myself. And I'm really grateful to you guys too. So thank you. Well, awesome. Um, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to reach out to me or Nathan and, um, and we'll, we'll be uh, getting closer, you know, as we get uh, into closer this summer with this. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. Yeah.